is recording beautiful we're off and uh at the dances ready to rock and roll so morning everyone welcome to global chats i'm sure you've got used to my dulcet tones over the last few months but uh i'm mark the vp of sales and delivery for the new zealand adaption team <clears throat> and i'm joined today by Corey, my co-host and uh, kasha our wonderful guest Corey, say hi to the folks Hi, everyone. So nice to see you. Welcome. Beautiful. And Akasha, we're going to hear a lot from you today, but even anything you'd like to say just to connect in with the group as we start. Just incredibly grateful to be here and be joining you from across many oceans. I think some of you may be three or so oceans, but we'll find out more about that when we introduce ourselves, I think. Yeah, that's but nice to be here. Thank you, mate. Welcome, welcome. And uh, welcome to today's se session that's all about belongingness. Um, as always with these sessions, all you need is your good selves being present so you can connect in and listen to the call. A pen, a piece of paper, because I find the best form of memory comes in a pen, i.e. writing stuff down. And as we go through, if questions pop into your mind, comments or things you'd like to share, Feel free to capture them. There'll be an opportunity later on to connect in and share those ideas or questions with Akasha and the team. So uh, we will welcome those very much. Um, as we go through this, we're going to kick off with our usual, usual format of some rapid fire questions, some deep dives with Akasha and some menti polls to keep our fingers and toes rocking and rolling as we go through the session. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Corey for the rapid fire section of today's session. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. By way of introduction, I'm Chief Leadership Officer Americas for Adeption. Been here just going on 10 months and have been delighted to join these global chat sessions with Mark and then meet amazing people from around the globe. Akasha, do you want to do a quick intro before we get going with rapid fire? Ah, sure. Let's do that. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm located in Grenada. So my reference about many oceans earlier is because I am in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and some of you might very well know where that is. And if not, don't be shameful about checking a map. And I, I, I love these conversations. I love meeting people, love engaging and uh, belongingness and growth are two essential things to me and i think they grow they go hand in hand and also grow hand in hand you know i think without a sense of belonging growth and development is um uh, can be the experience of growth and development can be hindered you know and i think our i think we're here because we we want to support people's growth and that's a part of the work that we do and i'm looking forward to engaging with you all about that and growing together i love that setup thanks akasha and just to everyone be thinking about as you probably already are questions that you want to ask akasha as we get towards the kind of the back half of our time together because we'll open it up for your questions but first of all, Akasha, we're going to get to know you a little bit. So what do you love best about your work? Ooh. Huh. Uh, you know, it's, I think it's, it's the moments when, when people, I, when I see people move from like the sidelines of an organization because they haven't been feeling like, like they've been seen by leadership or colleagues and i watch them move closer and closer towards the center and that being in the center allows us to see like different uh forms of them you know it's like they you see oh man this person is an incredible leader this person is an incredible director an incredible artist an incredible singer <laughs> whatever it is you know so it's the it's that movement of people feeling like okay i don't know if i belong here to actually this is home and then this the benefits that come along with that like that that's the best part of my work and also this happens in multiple contexts right so i see it in my own family 
it's my own son. I see it in organizations that I belong to or networks and communities I belong to. And in organizations where I serve as either a consultant, a coach, a facilitator, or, or an educator, I also teach here at the university. So I see it in a lot of contexts and it's always a similar thing. It's very, very similar uh, setup and also similar set of moves that allow people to make that sort of realization and feel at home. So that's the best part of my work. Amazing. If you weren't doing this, all the things you just mentioned, what would you be doing? Uh, I would be um, walking. So I, I fancy myself a pilgrim. So I walked a few pilgrimages, including the Camino de Santiago, 500 miles, took me five weeks. So I would be just walking the world. Um, and it doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter the terrain. Um, yeah. I would I would be walking nonstop. <laughs> Are you sure it's walking? Because I heard aspirations of cycling, lycra, and some professional this, speeds going on. It, it would be all of those, and also climbing some mountains along the way, Mark. Because I also fancy myself a rock climber. Now I've never climbed, like done rock climbing, but I sleep and I can see myself doing it, and I'm convinced that I can do it very well. So yes, to to all of those. <laughs> And maybe you've answered our next question. What about something not on your resume? Ah, oh, I think it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's, I would say something similar. You know, it's about um, challenging myself more mentally than anything else. And also being out and about. Because the rock climbing and the cycling that Mark was mentioning, I engage in some of these activities because I also want to find my own limit within myself. Some of it is physical, but it's not like I'm not like a big high performance kind of person. That's not the point. It's like when I'm running a marathon or half marathon and I get to like three miles and there's this voice in my head that says, you're stupid. Why are you doing this? You're tired. You should go home and like watch Netflix or read a book. And and I get over that <laughs> and I enjoy the race. So that that part, this is the thing that... Um, uh, it's the challenge. It's like a mental challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about a nickname that you were known by and where it originated? <laughs> I love these questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a nickname I was no, you know, the one that keeps popping up is is Denny. I, so I grew up in Jamaica. And it's nowhere in my name, you know, like you, my name here is Akasha and my, my, my mom um, called me, named me Pete Saunders, but a lot of my journey and I realized I changed my name, um, which was very challenging for her at first and, and now not so much of a challenge. Um, but everyone used to call me Denny and you know what, Corey, I have no idea why they called me that. <laughs> I don't know who started it. I don't know why. And this but you're be... replied to, to many different names, I take it now. This is right. So I have a lot okay. of I have a lot of names. How about your newest go-to app on your phone? Oh, newest go-to app. I am gonna say it's between um Otter, which is like a note-taking transcribing app that I learned about powered a couple by, of weeks ago. Powered by AI, right? Powered by AI, that's the one. Amazing, and, okay. And also CapCut. So I've been, I've been learning about social media and Instagram videos. And I look at videos, I'm like, those are really well done. How do they do that? And a social media yeah. person told me about CapCut. It's a free app and you can edit your videos. It's easy to use. So I've been enjoying it. And I did my first video the other day about what meditation isn't. And I teach a metaphysical class here in Grenada. I do a lot of things. So I teach people like mental things. <laughs> and so I was making a video about how sitting on top of a mountain isn't the answer. And I, and I made a video that's like a minute and 20 seconds. And I felt like a pro, like it was, I thought it was really well done. Now, 
other people might think otherwise, but I'm very, very proud of myself. Amazing. So Kepka Amazing. and Otto powered by AI. Okay, thank you. Hang on, just dropping things over here. All right. So the next thing I'm interested in is um, what are you reading or listening to right now? Oh, Corey, I really like these questions. Um, so I'm listening to one thing and also reading a few things. <laughs> I'll tell you, there, there are maybe two things I mentioned that I'm listening to. One is um, I just recently subscribed to a uh, YouTube I guess it's a podcast, but it's on YouTube. It's called The Diary of a CEO. And I've been listening to some of these conversations and, and I've been enjoying them. And then I am listening to a book, an uh, audible book um, called Reality is Not What It Seems. So this is a, it's a quantum physics kind of book and about energy and energy management and so on, but it's a scientific book. Um, so, so that one, and then I'm reading, I'm reading a couple of books, but the two that I'll mention that I, that I really would like to mention is, a uh, one that I just started mm -hmm. called the hands of light by a woman named Barbara Ann Brennan. It's like a human energy healing book. And then the other one by one of my favorite authors, his name is Paco Underhill called how we eat. When I was in grad school, I read one of Paco's book called Why We Buy. So he's a um, behaviorist, so a psych a organizational psychologist, but he studies, he works for a lot of supermarket chains and restaurants and actually consult with them about what drives human behavior around consumption. You know, so he helps all supermarkets and grocery stores lay out products and where to put what products for what target population. Is a is a I I love the way he works, but I also love the way he thinks. And he and he's he works with a lot of data, and I respect data. <laughs> Those are amazing recommendations. Um, thank you for that, and. A little bit, thank you for the rapid fire questions. So a little yeah. bit of a, a setup now, as you, Mark, and I were talking about this session, your use of the word belongingness is yeah. purposeful. Yeah. Why do you feel such a passion for belongingness for everyone in organizations? Yeah, yeah, great. So before I answer that question real quickly, I'll, I'll share this because Folks might be surprised, you know, like I'm not watching or reading anything about belonging or belongingness. And that's actually intentional <laughs> because for me, I, I've been, I found that I learn a lot from many other disciplines and fields about what fosters belonging than from the field of DEI itself. You know, so when I read about artificial intelligence or I read about why we shop and what we're looking for when we go into a grocery store, you know, like these things give me more insights about how we foster inclusion and belonging for people than when I read a belonging book about how we foster inclusion and belonging for people, you know. And so um, I'll, I'll use that as a as a setup because even, for example, when I when I mentioned um, how we eat and why we eat. Some of the things I'm learning from this book feel so relevant to your question to me, Corey. Because one chapter I read um, from, from this book is about, um, you know, these days when, when maybe not just these days, but more and more people are looking for healthier options to eat. Right. Even if you're not plant based like me, you might want more options that are healthy and plant based. But when you go into a supermarket, you at least here in Grenada, where I live and many other places where I visit, you don't see a lot of those options. So you leave feeling as though actually you're not valued. You're my way of consuming and being with the world isn't seen or valued. You know, so how do organizations, supermarket chains and restaurants uh, see me? A, a quick joke about this. So I went to yesterday, I was at a um, uh, uh, 
uh, guest house here in Grenada and way up in the mountains. And I let them know ahead of time that I'm plant-based. And they, they said, I got you. We told the chef and everything is okay. We'll take care of you. I went to dinner last night and, you know, they said they'll do like a very nice vegetable casserole and so on. And it's taken, they put in a lot of love and attention into it. And it came out and I went and they brought the food out and it looks really amazing and yummy and it smells good and it tastes good. And what's on top of it is mozzarella cheese. And so, <laughs> and so I said, uh, actually, this is real cheese. I said, no, 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 it's, it's, it's vegan. We don't put any meat on it, you know? And so <laughs> what I realized and learned, and I'm learning this more and more, especially here in Grenada, is that people actually, those who eat plant-based often find it really challenging to do that because others are not understanding what that means. And we're also not telling them really what it is. You know, so when someone makes a, a mistake like this, we usually either complain or leave it. We actually don't educate each other. Um, so my experience at this place, for example, I left there feeling like actually, you know, they were trying their best to really see me. And they were being really accommodating and they missed the mark because they didn't really fully understand what it means to be plant-based or to be vegan. And so in a lot of organizations, what I see us doing is we are doing a lot of focus on diversity. You know, we want to bring in more people who are different across different dimensions, whether that's race, gender, sexual orientation, language, um, disciplines, like perspectives. Like we want to we want to say, listen, we have so many people who are different here, bring them in. And then when they get to the organization, they actually do not feel seen. You know, they feel like, okay, now I'm here, but the here where I am isn't actually ready for me. And so we might get the diversity piece right. We may even get the inclusion piece. Non-dairy icing, I might add, on the cake is belonging. And, and it's an experience. Going back to your question, Corey, like when I say belongingness and not just belonging, because belongingness for me is more of a felt experience that, ah, oh, I am seen. You know, look at this chef, like they figured out you know, eating plant-based means no regular cheese, no animal cheese. And I'm, they're, they're going to ask me these things. You know, I have a colleague this morning, we were having a talk, we were trying to plan for a gathering. And, uh, and we reach out to her and we're telling her about the place where this gathering is going to be. And one of the reasons why we did that, there are about 80 of us or so in this firm. And one of the reasons why we did that, even though she's the only person who's in a wheelchair, but you see, oftentimes when we go somewhere, she, these places are hardly accommodating of her experience and her mobility. And so she usually left this experience feeling, oh, yes, I'm with my colleagues and I didn't feel as though I belonged there. So that sense, like her belongingness scale or level was super low. And so while we're focusing on bringing in a lot of diversity and we talk about belonging belongingness really gets to the core of someone's lived experience of was i included or not was i seen or not so this is why it matters to me and this is the distinction between it for me belonging is like yeah we can do belonging <laughs> but belongingness is not something we can do belongingness is an experience that we can facilitate one conversation one engagement one plant-based cheese at a time. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, so powerful and we all want that, right? We all wanna feel seen. We all wanna feel like we're bringing our whole selves to work. I'm gonna hand to Mark to tap into the wisdom of this crowd around belongingness. Beautiful, thanks Corey. And uh, Akasha, it's always interesting hosting on these shows because uh, 
It's amazing how you provoke thinking. And so I'm trying to be in facilitator mode and yet I'm drawn into the story and the conversation and reflecting deeply on my own life and my son. And does he feel a sense of belonging? And um, my youngest yeah. has got Down yeah. syndrome. He um yeah. he feels part of the family and sometimes the games elude him. He finds it difficult to engage in some of the games. And so I'll try and stay focused as a facilitator, but you're drawing me in beautifully. Thank you for that. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go to a menti poll. Hopefully this won't create that sense of if you're technologically challenged, oh my God, I don't belong in this forum. Just give it a go. Um, it's relatively easy to use. And if you find it just too challenging for the brain for this time of the day, then feel free to pop your own answers into the chat. That's also absolutely fine. So I'll pop it up on the screen. For those that are technologically savvy, you can do a QR barcode scan. For those that are a little bit more old school like me, you can type www.menti.com into your browser or into your phone and just pop in the Menti code there. There's two in, that gives me a sense. Four, six, eight, awesome. It gives me a sense the Menti is working. That always helps me to breathe more easily as the session goes on. Once you're in and you clicked, I will do a forward arrow and allow us to go to the next slide, which has a question on it that relates directly to the question and the reflection Corey was sharing with Akasha there. So where's home for you? Let's uh, have a look around the world. Hopefully, again, we've captured a few different categories for different places in the world that you might be from. That gives you enough of a sense of you're being seen here today. <laughs> whilst also being mindful not to capture every single city because there's only something like 12 categories I can use on this slide. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's creating belonging in a place where sometimes the technology doesn't allow that fully. Beautiful. What a lovely mix of people from different places of the world there. As you say, many oceans, Akasha. Yeah. And hopefully I've selected a, an image that might represent uh, a sense of connecting and belonging. Um, and just have a little look at the question there, that feeling sense of belonging, what words or feelings would reflect that sense of belonging for you? It does allow two or three reflections back if one won't do it for you. So when you're feeling a real sense of belonging, how does it feel for you? What words reflect that? Mm. I love the real time build as I try and flick my head from side to side to read the words here. Beautiful. Yeah, sense of comfortable peace. Enthused, what's possible, the interconnectivity. Lots of beautiful words and feelings that create that sense of when we feel seen and heard and valued and appreciated for who we are in the context and the group that we're in. Awesome. And then the final of the questions as these keep popping up <clears throat> is around, and why does it matter? So apologies, each of the responses, you're limited to something like 25 letters or something. So you're going to have to think succinctly for this one. I kept having to change what I put in here, <laughs> I realized, because I'm a little bit verbose. So why does belongingness matter to you? And just as people are responding, Akasha, feel free, of course, to just allow it to wash over you, connect, mm. and see yeah, what resonates, what connects as the picture starts to shape, um, any themes that you observe, et cetera. there's also a little phrase at the top that i hopefully do justice with in terms of pronouncing it which is fanonatanga which is a new zealand term that 
I understand, and others will, I'm sure, be able to build on this, is a sense of family extended beyond your family, the community that you create with people that really matter around you. So um, a lot of organizations are embracing Fenona Tonga as a way to create belongingness for people to create a sense of being part of something to be seen and to be valued. So Akasha, and I will hand back the speaking stick to you, Corey, um, but I'll tee off the question. You know, what strikes you as you look at this? What resonates? What comes to mind that you'd like to share? Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Mark and, and everyone for, for sharing what matters to you. Like, it's really lovely to see, get a sense of who we are here. You know, it feels like one big heart of us saying these things are important to us. And it's a part of what I notice and feel is both the sort of like individual benefit of what belongingness enables, as well as the collective benefit, you know? So when I look at things like, you know, it helps me have a sense of self-worth, you know, individual and make the world better, you know? So like that, and the more of us have this sense of self-worth, imagine a world filled with people who know that they're seen and loved, all right? able being able to be my true self and also unlocking human potential right so like this polarity is is alive for me when i look at i look at what you've all shared here so the the, the i and the we the individual and the collective and then also this perhaps another polarity like what the feeling one one gets when when they experience belongingness and what it enables them to do you know so i suppose the being and the doing so i can feel like myself and i'm able to do more i'm able to unlock potential i'm able to build relationship i'm able to drive engagement i'm able to do some things you know support my team better mm -hmm. You know, so this interplay between being and doing is kind of like part of what I was alluding to earlier about belongingness and growth. And all they, I think for me, they grow, they go hand in hand. If we are about growth in ourselves and in others, then it means that we must foster belongingness in those contexts where we are supporting growth. And I can, I see that in, in what we have shared here about what matters to us. So it's like the head and heart connection that someone that someone yeah. mentioned. So Akasha, thanks everyone for your input on the Mentimeter polls. So Akasha, I mean, when we look at why belongingness matters and, and we see words like effectiveness and connection and synergy, potential growth, joy and happiness, everyone wants that organization, yeah. organizations definitely want that. Here's the question. Are there any watchouts to be mindful of? Uh, and how do organizations evolve through any watchout points? Yeah, yeah. Um, one that we started talking about from one of your earlier questions, Corey, is the, mm -hmm. the focus on diversity, you know, like the focus on bringing in more people who are different and um, sometimes we can get over focus on diversity and miss out on the opportunities to enable this sense of belonging. You know, so again, this could we could maybe hold this as a both end. So while we are attracting those who are different from the rest of us, how are we also ensuring that when they show up, they have a sense of inclusion and belonging? Well, another dimension, perhaps a third dimension is also enabling, continuing to enable those that who have been there to experience belonging. Because sometimes, I've seen this in so many other organizations as well, as an organization moves towards more diversity and inclusion and belonging, those who have been there have a sense of like, so what about me? I don't matter anymore. And so a watch out is to make sure that inclusion and belonging is not just for the new people. It's not just for the, the new diversity hire, 
but it also extends it's for everybody in the organization <laughs> you know and so belonging is not just for segments of an organization or community belongingness to your point you mentioned this at least twice Corey is universal like we all want it we all desire it and all of us oftentimes I have seen so far have an experience of not experiencing it some at some point in our lives we have experienced not having not the sense of belongingness so it matters to all of us it to does. me in the Caribbean and to you in the U.S. and to you in New Zealand and everywhere else in between like belongingness is the, I suppose, the ocean, the one body of water that connects us. Thank you for that. Mark, what are you curious about next? Yeah, and even as we shape these questions, um, I'm mindful that language can create separation as well as connection, right? We've heard people talk yeah. about three-letter acronyms and phrases that we use. And in our field, we we use a lot of phrases that can create connection, but also can create disconnection if people have never come across them. So apologies for a couple of um, words that I've thrown into this question, but it's around our mindset stage and cognitive bias, you know, the filters, the lenses, the shades that we wear um, will inform our openness and approach to this whole topic. What do we yeah. need to be conscious of as we bring this topic into our lives, Akasha? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for framing the question in that way, Mark, because I also I also have a perspective that the our mindset, our mindset contributes to our both our experience of belongingness as well as our capacity to enable belongingness in others and in organizations. You know, so um, I often talk about listening to see when I when I engage organizations around their belongingness work, and listening to see, listening to see is a is a is a practice of um, is a practice that really enables us to be paying attention to three things. One is the level of self. So you can think of these as, you know, as a Venn diagram in a way we're listening to see somewhere in the middle. So listening to see ourselves, this is about the biases that you were just naming, Mark. It's like, what am I bringing to my leadership, my coaching, my parenting, partnering, and et cetera, that might allow or constrain me from seeing the other? Because we can assert and I am asserting that it is when we feel seen that we experience this sense of belongingness. It's like, ah, oh, Corey, like I've been noticing that you keep smiling when you talk, you know, and it actually eases me quite a bit. You know, it relaxes me, makes me feel, oh, okay, I can just keep looking at Corey for this entire conversation. <laughs> you know, this is super helpful, right? So when someone, when someone feels seen, that that does something, but they others will feel seen to the degree that we look at them, that we see them. And to the degree that we see and look at others is also based on the lens through which we look and what is shading those lenses that we're looking through. And our biases is one of them. Our own trauma is one of them. You know, earlier I was talking with, uh, I was uh, running a coaching session with another coach and they were sharing how their, their origin trauma of abandonment shows up in their coaching. And so there's some things that trigger them when they're with some leaders. So this is the listening to see, listening to see what am I bringing to my engagement with others, engagement with others across differences across our differences. So seeing ourselves and then listening to see the other, which is so, also super important. What matters to you and what are you bringing here? You know, so we use inquiry, we use curiosity, we use appreciation to see others. And then we're also looking at the shared context, the space that we're in together. Can we see and feel into that? And what is enabling this space and what might be in the space that's constraining our experience of belonging? So paying attention, I think, to those three dimensions, 
myself what am i bringing how do i see you more as a result of that and as we're seeing each other what's in this space one of the questions i keep asking people more and more and i start with my family actually so i've been and been engaging with them in a sort of experiment i was gonna say guinea pigs but they're human beings so i've been engaging in an experiment with my family especially my son and you know sometimes we talk Mark knows a lot about my son. He, he's, he, he has cerebral palsy and he, 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 inclusion is, is also super important to him um, and to me as well. So I keep asking this question, how can, I, how can I see you more? So, you know, I, I might be in a conversation with my son and he's telling me a story and I miss something, which is quite typical <laughs> it's like yes dad and you know dot, 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 dot. And so I learned something and I miss something and then sometimes at the end of those conversations I then ask how can I see you more son how can I see you more and he's gonna tell me what matters to him and I'm gonna keep trying to see him based on what matters to him and then I start using that with clients and I start using that with colleagues just that simple question how can I see you more? And you know, one of the things that I've been noticing and learning, most people say this to me. They, they say, you know what? I'm not really sure, but by you asking that question, I feel seen because you're letting me know that I matter to you. <laughs> so there are some moves that we can make as well that enable belongingness in ourselves and in each other. And one such move is a question like that. Like, how can I see you more? Because if we agree with you, Corey, which I do, we all want to be seen. If we all want to be seen, well, why don't we just practice seeing each other? <laughs> you, know? you know, why don't we just ask? If you want to be seen and I want to be seen, why don't I tell you how I feel seen? And why don't I ask you, how do you feel seen? And then we just practice that. There's, there's this other experiment I was running with my wife on the weekend. And we were in this argument. It was, our arguments, they're not always intense. This one was intense. <laughs> it's like, da -da 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 -da. And I was like, ah, oh, hold on a minute. Something tells me that you are wanting me to say something specific. I know in my head, I want you to say something specific that you haven't said yet. What if we just put that on the table? <laughs> so she then said, oh, this is what I've been hoping that you would say. I just want you to say to me, Sweda, I see you and I know this is hard for you. And I wanted her to say, oh, honey, you're working so hard and I know this is a lot. <laughs> and so it's so amazing. So when we said, share these things, it, everything just stopped. All the energy and the intensity, just like it just rushed out of the room. And then we just said those things to each other. And it was, it was like magic. It was like magic. She said, oh, sweetie, I know you've been working hard. And I see you. Yes. <laughs> and I said what Kaka. she wanted to do. And, I love and we that. I love yeah. it, cannot wait to use it myself, to just diffuse the situation, own what it is I want, and give the other person an opportunity to say, to name what they want. Yes. So much, so much goodness in what you just said. I know Mark and I have several more questions, but want to give uh, everyone else an opportunity to ask a question. What are you curious about with Akasha? Uh, feel free to put your question in chat. Feel free to come off mute uh, or raise your hand, but would love to open it up so others can have the opportunity to ask questions. What are you curious about?
I'll go ahead, Akasha. So I'm Lauren Rollins. I work for Akamai Technologies based out of Cambridge. So live in South Boston. So I think I was one of the only ones that was based out of the, the eastern um, part of the U.S. for today. Um, but within Akamai Technologies and I'm part of the global talent development team there, we're hearing a lot about, which I think connects really well with belongingness, is this sense of connection. So a sense of belonging almost in a way. And it's something that our organization is challenged with across the globe because we do work so remotely now. So we're continuing to hear that people don't necessarily feel connected to their team, to their manager, to the culture, to the yeah. organization. And it's especially hard for new hires to have that sense of belonging or that connectedness because they're not going into an office, they're not meeting their team, they might never meet their team in person. So what are some strategies or best practices that you might be able to offer? And connection means different things to different people, which is also part of that challenge. But is there anything or a handful of things that you've seen work really well, especially in this remote environment or hybrid environment that we're in? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Lauren. My, my response might be a little bit uh, strange to some, um, and maybe like, uh, it would make sense to hopefully to everyone anyway. Um, you know, and I love this other question in the chat about how do you foster belonging in a very large, complex organization? Um, I think of belongingness as a complex challenge. And by that, I mean, it's not a thing that can be solved. Connection isn't a thing that can be solved. So people in organization might say, oh, we need more connection. And you know what? Some people might scramble and they will create like, you know, virtual um, after party. They'll create like chat, fire chat, virtual this and all kinds of things. And you know what? People are still going to say, I don't feel connected. So in, in, in our firm, I remember, I see Jeff here. So Jeff might relate to this. Jeff and I are colleagues at Cultivating Leadership. And in our firm, one of our, we get together at least once a year, like someplace in the world, and we all try to get together. And uh, one of the last two ones, I think, some of our colleagues with young children were saying, I don't think I can make it because I have young kids and it's gonna be too much to travel with them. and or what are you going to do if I bring them? And, you know, it's just like a half a dozen, a handful of folks who were like, really, this was really big for them. And, you know, the thing we decided to do was actually just have conversations with them. So we decided, let's just have one-on-one -on -one conversation with these colleagues. The ones that said they, could, they wouldn't be able to come because they have a young family. And we asked them what might they need and da 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 And, you know, the strangest thing happened, Lauren. They then said, oh, everything is okay. I'll be there. I'll be there. So part of the thing I learned from that experience is that people aren't necessarily looking for us to solve their problems. People want us to know that we see them, that they have a problem or that they have a challenge. So I think when some when a group says, this doesn't have to be the only answer either. When a group says, how can we connect more in this virtual world, da, 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 da. I think fundamentally, maybe the first thing is, actually, how do you see and acknowledge that this is a challenge? How do you people actually see, oh, right, a lot of us actually want to be connected and we're finding it hard to connect right now. I think people just want that acknowledgement. It might not be the only thing that they need, but I think fundamentally, we want to be acknowledged for the things that matter to us. We don't want people to solve our problems. There are exceptions for sure. I can think of a few, <laughs> think for the most part. We don't want that. You know, so I, I use different tools. I, some of these tools are, might be used under the banner of enabling like leadership for complex times, but I think they also facilitate belonging. Tools like polarity mapping, you know, tools like, you know, any anything that have people come together, really. The, to me, the point of polarity mapping isn't only to facilitate both and thinking. To me, the point of polarity mapping is also to bring in multiple perspectives and bringing in multiple perspectives you know, is an act of belongingness. Because people get to say, oh yeah, this matters to me about that challenge, about that poll, about that, about this. And then when they get to voice that and be heard, their thing gets captured and put on a map then they feel seen. It's like what we did with Menti. Menti is a cool tool. 
But menti also fosters belongingness. That to me is the core function of mentimeter or many of these things. You know, you look and you see your thing up there and you see other people sing up there and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm here. So how can we, more of those things, Lauren, more of those, how do we enable people to, for, for them to have an experience of being heard about the thing that is bothering them? Because we can't solve them. No, you might solve it for a few people, you know, with a, with a response or whatever you decide to do, but not for everybody. So thank you for that. Not for everybody. Thank you for the question. Sure. So to Megan, Megan, so this is I, what I shared, I think is, I would say a similar thing to your question, right? So fostering belongingness in, in a complex organization that's going through change. I don't think Megan is here anymore. I don't see them. But I would also say a similar thing because organizations are going through change all the time, especially now. And so I think fundamentally it's also acknowledging that this thing is real. Don't tell them it's made up or, oh, let's get over it. It's like just acknowledging, acknowledging and appreciating their perspective. So to, I, I guess in, essentially what I'm saying there is like, it's still about people. <laughs> It doesn't matter how complex the organization is or how complex the change is. It's still about people. Beautiful. Hey, I'm going to try a shot in the dark. I know that um, Phil, your questions triggered a couple of other builds. Are you okay to um, unmute and just share with the group your question? And, uh, and then Akasha can engage in that one as well, buddy. You hear me right? Perfect, mate. Um, yeah, my question, Akasha, is... You know, um, absolutely, and you might you actually answered a little bit is when you, when you do try the sense of belonging, certainly for some situations that are quite emotional and personal to people, and you do get it wrong, and you do don't quite hit the mark. Thinking about your mozzarella cheese, yes. What, what is your what is your kind of recommendation when you end up in that situation? And also, do you think it's better to try and fail than not try at all? Yeah. Uh, thanks for that, Phil. Phil, um, my guess is that you know you already have your own answers to this question, which I which I am appreciating because I also have a sense of what it is. <laughs> and I will also say this, Phil, it's the number one question that leaders ask. You know, all levels in an organization, they're they're like, how do I not mess up or something to the effect that well, but if i do but if i do that and it causes some harm then what do i do because i mean i do something there's some things i find super incredible about this question one of them is how much we humans actually care about each other like the fact that we are like i don't want to cause harm or wound another human being like that's just the first thing that pops up for me. And I mean, a lot of people ask this question, a lot of leaders in different contexts. So by asking this question, I'm like, oh God, I feel like there's so much hope for us. So that's just the first thing. Like we actually care about each other. And then the second thing, there's a, we're always going to mess up. We're going to stumble. We're going to bumble. We're going to step on each other. We're going to say the wrong thing, pronounce someone's name the wrong way. Like, God bless you, Phil. You're like a one syllable name. You know, if anyone gets that wrong, it's like, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> but I've been called Acacia, Akasha, Shasha, all type of things just today. <laughs> you know, so people are going to mess up. People are going to use the wrong pronoun with each other. They're going to be going to do it because that's also human nature. This is how we learn, I think. We try a thing, we mess up, we learn and we move on. So I've been sharing this simple acronym with leaders and coaching clients called ROAR. I'm going to put it in the chat here. So when we mess up, when we mess up, practice recognizing that we have messed up. And especially, let's try and do it before the other person said you messed up. But sometimes that won't happen. And when that doesn't happen, when someone says, hey, that's not how you pronounce my name, you don't need to defend yourself, actually. Just like own it. So that's the O. Own it. So recognize you have messed up and own it. Don't, oh, it's because I grew up in a different country and our accent sounds like this. Stop blaming your country. No, just own it and continue on. 
Okay. And then the next thing is to appreciate their difference. Appreciate that this matters to them. You know, like, oh, wow. I mean, you. I'm getting that the way that I say your name really matters to you. And I respect that. And I am sorry for messing up. And would you give me another chance to just, can you, sometimes I say, could you just say it one more time for me? And just a little bit slowly. And they are usually willing to do that in the case of name. And they would say it and I would just keep practicing, keep practicing. Right? And that's the last R. That's the repair. Take action that will help repair the relationship based on the other person's terms and conditions. You know, so they might say, no, 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 I'm not going to say my name again. I've already said it 20 times. You're like, okay, is there any way that I can, uh, you know, own this experience and repair this relationship with you? And hardly anybody is going to say no. The most but some people might say is I need some time because I was really offended and I need a little bit of time. And you honor that. You respect that. You give them time. So when you mess up, Phil, and all of us, Grace, Lauren, Akasha, Mark, Corey, when we mess up later today <laughs> or tomorrow, do not be quiet about it. Like roar. Like recognize, oh boy, I just did this thing. I'm so sorry. Own it. Appreciate the difference that, that, that this thing makes for this person. And take some actions to repair it. At, with anybody at any level, I do this with my son all the time. So with your family, with your clients, with your colleagues, with the person you pass on the street, you know, whatever. I think this can be applied to in any, any context. Because it's also about just being human with each other. I think we have these expectations, like these high standards for ourselves and for each other, like we should get it right, especially in the DEIB space. Like we, we, we have to get it right. But there's no such thing. I don't think there's any such thing. You know what? Just the other day, you could call, you know, a person who looks like me in the US colored and it was okay. And just the other day, you could call them African-American and it was okay. And tomorrow, none of those things are okay. Because <laughs> we are changing. We are dynamic. We are complex human beings. And so we are going to mess up. We're going to mess up. And so we learn. So yes, Phil, we try and we learn, we mess up and we keep going and we will grow as a result. This is my observation and intention and hope. I love that. And I'll, uh, I'll share with Don, our CEO, the raw acronym, because lion is one of his favorite animals in the world. So uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> um, we've got, we've got time for one more question that I'll ask on behalf of the audience. And then a, a heads up, there are some questions that we haven't got to. Uh, we've seen them. We will spend a bit of time afterwards and I'll invite Akasha to reflect on them and share responses to all of you after the session. Um, but the one I'm just going to, uh, connecting with now, uh, Akasha, is how do we start creating belongingness when people don't feel psychologically safe? Yeah. And thank you, Grace. Yeah, yeah thank you for that as well, Grace. Um, I have an experiment with us. Okay. When you are, just picture, when you have been somewhere, when it didn't feel safe for you. What mattered to you then? Whether that was at a workshop, in a meeting with some, you know, with your boss or your boss's boss or your client, with family members. Sometimes I really don't feel psychologically safe around some of my family members. And so, you know, kind of stay away from them but sometimes I can't when you find yourself in a situation like that what matters most to you like what would help you feel safe just drop that in the chat I'm going to participate too Yeah, I'm right there with you, Phil. I wrote something similar. 
in the in terms of acknowledgement yeah Corey like it's a similar sort of thing my my what I shared is a similar sentiment like if if someone what I shared is that if someone even one person were to say to me Akasha I have a sense I might be wrong but I have a sense that this situation might not be the safest for you if someone says that to me oh boy I would feel like okay I can breathe a little someone sees that it is challenging for me to be here it might not change the challenge of the situation, but I have an ally, I have a companion. And to me, oh geez, I think Grace, this is both the simplest and perhaps the greatest thing that we can do for each other, to be companions with each other. One of my favorite shows is Ted Lasso. If you haven't watched Ted Lasso, watch Ted Lasso. It is amazing. And I think it was maybe in season one, someone was going through a hard time. It was maybe Sam. But anyway, Sam was like really hurting. And I think Ted Lasso said something to the effect of one of the worst things than hurting and suffering or being in pain is being in pain alone or suffering alone, something to that effect. And I actually believe this and found this to be true. So essentially, belongingness is really about companionship. It's like not suffering alone because we're all suffering. We're all in pain. And can we recognize that there's companionship in it? So again, I don't think this is a thing that needs to be fixed. I don't think psychological safety is a thing that's like, because someone is going to feel unsafe. Even when, if 99 of 100 people feel safe and one person feels unsafe, that still matters. So how do we engage that? We don't say, oh, well, it's safe for everybody else. Well, what's the problem with you? No, I mean, we don't do that. Then we make it even more unsafe. I think it's in the acknowledgement. I think it's in the acknowledgement, like Jay said, one person recognizing it and saying so. That. Beautiful. Thank you. And um, just before I hand over to Corey for the very last question from our crib sheet is um just a couple of things firstly we are exploring the terrain for future guests and future sessions and we haven't yet landed what they'll be so we've got a call coming up to go what would we love to explore what who would we love to engage if they're anything like akasha we will be in safe hands akasha it's been magnificent beautiful phenomenal to hear your wisdom and more importantly, to fill your heart as you share and connect on the stuff that really matters. Um, you have a way of articulating it that just resonates powerfully. And just thank you for being here um, and sharing what you know in the way that you have. It's been fantastic. Thank you, Mark. It's been it's been a delight, actually, to be here with you all um, and to also feel your energy and love for each other. Um, thank you for that. So two quick things before we end. One of them is hopefully you'll take a moment. The purpose of our global chats is to provoke your thinking and um, encourage you to take an action. So if you haven't already, take a moment and think about how you might apply some insight. What action might you take? as a result of the wisdom that Akasha has shared in our time together. And then Akasha, one last question for you. If you, um, if you could think, what advice, quote, or saying would you put on a billboard? <laughs> Maybe just listen. Maybe actually I would say, shh. That's what I would put on a billboard. Love it. Thank you, everyone. Roland has um, dropped a link in the chat to provide feedback. Akasha, thank you so much. It's been it's been wonderful time. And thanks to everyone for your thoughtful questions and for being here. Thank thanks you, all. Mark. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful. Go well. Enjoy your days. Connect and shh. <laughs> and so people feel heard. Thank you. Bye, Jeff. <laughs>